Why would you help, please? Go ahead and d Dylan, lead us, please, sir. Dear God, thank you for our stay. Pray to you bless and keep us safe. Please let Brother Russell give us a good message, and please let someone get saved today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Before I start, all of you that watch us on television, we'd like to invite you to come to church here at Antioch in Edgerly at 1030 on Sunday morning. You'd be very welcome, and we thank you for watching. All right, y'all, this morning we're going to begin in Galatians 6, 7. Let's all stand for the reading of God's word. Galatians 6, 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Father in heaven, we ask you to anoint us today, Father, as we partake of your holy word. And Father, we would understand that serving you is very serious. And it must come from our heart. It must come from our soul. Lead us and teach us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody be seated. You know, folks, a lot of people think you can pull the wool over God's eyes. And I'm here today to tell you by the word of God, you cannot trick God because he knows your heart. And you know what? There's so many people that come to church, and I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about in the world. They go to church and they play a church game. They are not there no more for God than the man in the moon. Folks, we need to examine our hearts. Make sure when we walk through them doors, we come here for one reason, and that's to meet with Jesus. And you know, folks, it goes on. In Luke 16, 15, he says, And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. You know, today there's people that go to church, and it's nothing more than a club, a country club. There's a lot of people, you got to realize that they're not friendly and they're not likable. So if they can join a church, well, then they got a captive audience to be friends with. And a lot of times we see that. Make sure that's not your case. You know, if you come in a church, you come here to meet with Jesus. Make sure your heart is right every time you step in here. Because, the, to, in my opinion, the most serious and important thing we'll do during the week is to come to church and start off right. Start it with Jesus. Because, you know, people think, well, as long as I'm in church, I see a lot of politicians. They, they go to church to keep their good name. Or there's people in the neighborhood that go to church because they want to be respected. 
But you know, folks, when you, you look at this, that's an abomination to God if that's why you're coming to church. You cannot use God. There are people that use God. You know, as we look, we see different examples of that. In Acts 3.3, 3, a man sitting there and, oh, he was all messed up and who seeing Peter and John about to go to the temple asked an alms. Peter, fastening in his eyes upon John, said, look on us. And he gave heed to them, expecting to receive something of them. You know what? Here's this crippled guy sitting outside of the church and the apostles come up and the man is there and when they look at him, they, oh, they're going to give me some money. You know, folks, there are people that go to church to get money from the churches. They pay their light bills. They, sometimes they support their habits. I've had, I've had people that we helped them a couple times and then we didn't, no longer could help them. They would cuss us and just go plumb nuts. And we don't come here to get something out of this monetarily. We come here to get something spiritually. Well, you know what? When this man sees, oh, he thinks, hey, they're, they're apostles. I'm going to get some big bucks. But look, listen to what this says. Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such I give thee in the name of Jesus Christ. And now there's rise up and walk. You know something, folks? If you come in here, and I ain't talking to none of you because none of you do this, but if you come in here for a handout, you're coming here for the wrong reason. Yeah, if you want to come here for a spiritual awakening, you're here for the right reason. You come here for a healing or for God to control your life, well, they let him know, we don't have no cash for you. But one thing we do have, crippled man, stand up and walk in the name of Jesus. I don't know about you, but I'd much rather have the power of God affecting me than any money man could give me. Amen? And you look right here how this goes on to say, and he took him by the right hand. Folks, there's a right way and a wrong way, and God is always on the right. And he lifted him up. I hope today you are at this church because you want to be lifted up. Maybe you got a problem plaguing you with your family. This is the place to get lifted up. Maybe your health is not what it ought to be, or maybe you're having a financial problem. This is the place to get lifted up. Don't come here expecting something monetarily. Expect something much greater, something spiritual, because you see, money can't buy that. Money can't heal your cancer. Money can't get your son off of drugs. Money can't, you got my point, folks, but God can. And that's why we're here. I want Jesus to take you by the hand and take me by the hand, and immediately his feet and his ankle bones receive strength. Oh, folks, that's why we're here this morning. I want to start my week off with strength, and this is the place to get it. Come charge your batteries. Come get your tank filled. Come get full of the Holy Ghost and the knowledge of the Word, and you'll start your week off strong, folks. We don't want no coins. You know what? All these churches today that are begging for money, they need to be begging for the Holy Ghost. They need to be begging for the power of God. You know that? But you know something? Look what he did in verse 8. And he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. You see where he went, folks? He went into the temple. He didn't go his way. You know what? He's well. Just think all the things he couldn't do. Probably never had a date in his life. Boy, I bet he couldn't wait to go get a girl and go out and have a pizza or something. But you know he didn't. First thing he did, he went to church. And he was leaping and praising God. You know something, folks, so many times God heals people and they don't appreciate it. Oh, how many of these have I seen over the years? They get healed and then they're through with God. And that is a bad thing. Not this guy. Oh, he went in the temple and he was a hopping up and down. Now listen what happens. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. You know something, folks? Are your family and friends amazed at what's happened to you? I know I'm amazed at what happened to me. Because when I was lost, I was such a different, I was a fool. That's what I was. 
But boy, when I got saved, God done something that makes me want to leap and jump and praise God because I'm different now because the Holy Ghost opened my eyes. Folks, we come here to get our eyes opened. We come here to show people that God can make a difference. And this man, he done the right thing because he praised God. He jumped up and down until everybody saw there was a change in that man. Of course, there's another story in the Bible where these 10 lepers, uh, they came up there and, oh, they was eat up and rotten. And you know, today we have our bout with cancer. But in that day and time, it was leprosy. Everybody dreaded leprosy. They feared leprosy. Some types of leprosy was highly contagious. And people lived in a fear of it because it would literally rot your limbs off. Noses would rot off. Hands and legs would rot and fall off. The smell. You were rejected by society because who wants to go in, in the marketplace and try to smell a cantaloupe and somebody standing there with an arm rotting and all? You know, it was just it was a terrible thing. But you know, these lepers, they saw Jesus and they knew what he could do. And listen, and they lifted up their voices in Luke 17, 13 and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. You know, it's funny how when they're in need, it's Jesus, Master, oh, have mercy, so humble and contrite, oh, Master. That's how we always are when we need God. Funny how so many times after we get that blessing from God, we don't talk to him at all anymore. Listen, folks. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. You know, God does the healing. God does it all. But God always gives you a part to do in it so you know where it comes from. He said, Go show yourself to the priests. Well, as they were going, they happened to, Notice their hands wasn't burning and they wasn't itching and they unwrapped a little bit and the pus was gone. The skin was normal. The body was restored. Could you imagine? You imagine what a blessing that would be? Well, oh man, I'm telling you. Well, listen, listen to this. And one of them, one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he turned back and with a loud voice glorifying God, oh, he was a hooping and hollering. He ran back to Jesus hollering, praise God, I'm well. Praise God, I'm not rotting away. And he fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. Now, the reason it says that, because Samaritans were not godly people. They were rejected by God's people. They didn't have synagogues. They didn't go to church. They were undesirables. But this one was different. He appreciated what Jesus did. He went and found Jesus and he fell at his feet and cried and thanked him and thanked him and thanked him. You know, folks, Jesus answered and he said, Where were there not ten of you that was cleansed? But where are the nine? Jesus said, I could have swore I healed ten of you. Where's the other nine? You know, folks, there's so many people, they get saved and they never come back to church. I've known through the years people been healed. Uh, one particular man had congestive heart failure and he had 50 days to live. He didn't know us, but he came to this church because somebody told him people get healed here. Come from a construction job, come in here white as a sheet of paper crying, told me right there that he had around 50 days to live. He had congestive heart failure, nothing they could do. We laid hands on the man, and make a long story short, he got completely healed, and the doctors could not understand it because it went away. That don't happen. Only with Jesus. But you know, it didn't take him long. He found a reason to get mad at me, and it was a made-up reason. It wasn't even true. It wasn't even real. But yet, he quit on God. And now he's back in the world living just like he was before. That's a whole lot like this. And I've seen so much of it over the years. God heal people. And, and then don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about nobody that we might know right now. I'm not talking about that. Because we're all guilty of this. How many of us have been saved and we don't attend church every Sunday like we should? 
How many of us have had our babies <coughs> burning up with fever and God take it away? Do we read our Bible and thank God like we should? Or how many of us sit down to a meal and don't even recognize where it comes from? That's the same thing. We're mocking God because he gives us what we ask for, but as soon as we get it, we forget all about where we got it. Folks, we need to think about that. Think about it seriously. Well, in Isaiah 29, 13, Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as these people draw nigh to me with their mouth, and with their lips, they do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. You know, folks, there's a lot of churches today that people come together and they, they sing what they call 7-Elevens, the same song, seven words, 11 times, over and over and over, and they work themselves into a trance. And oh, they feel like they're so close to God. And then you go out to eat with them afterwards and they don't even bow their head and thank God for their potato salad. You know, there's something wrong with that picture right there. But you see, that's what we're happening today, the Laodicea in church. We got people to go to church and they go through all of the motions and oh, they're just so holy. But when they leave church, they leave it all right there in that pew. I'm gonna tell you something, folks, don't be like that. You and I need to make sure we're sincere with God. And, you know, you know this. Well, when we come to church, you ever notice how when you come in here, you don't have a problem slipping and cussing. You don't have a problem with a lot of things that we have problems with. You know why? Because you're in here where the power of God is strong. And it is. It's funny how we can't take that with us, huh? But as soon as we walk out the door, it's like that good behavior thing that we get only in here. It's like it dissipates. And it's that way with all of us. I don't care who you are. We need to really think about that, y'all. And, and we really need to focus on staying fired up for Jesus and being for real. And I'm going to tell you the way to do that is to be thankful, to be grateful for what he's done for you. And if you're grateful for what God has done, and folks, I had a man told me, what's God done for me? Well, you're breathing. You're not full of disease. You've got three healthy children. You've got a lot going for you, and you don't see none of that. Folks, if you just kind of examine yourself a little bit, you'd realize we are so blessed till it's just incredible. Kyle said it best a while ago. God gives us so much more than we deserve, but he don't give us what we do deserve. We need to be grateful to him. But you see, there are people that put on a show, and they're religious with their mouth, they honor God. Oh, with their lips, they honor God. But he's nowhere around their heart. And you can see that by the way they daily live. I don't understand how anyone can say they're a Christian and not come here and feed upon the word on Sunday morning because this is our food. You know, you don't see people missing meals physically, but it seems like the spiritual meat they can do without. It's because they don't have a spiritual stomach to digest it. Make no mistake, if you're truly born again, you're going to love your church. You're going to love your church family. And you're going to be here when the doors are open, if you can. Well, here's the thing in Matthew 23, 5. And you have this in many churches, but all their works they do for it to be seen of men. <coughs> they make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. You know... People will dress the holy look. And they make broad their flat, big old cross, you know, and stuff. And folks, your clothes and your paraphernalia is not what God's looking at. He's looking what's inside. And you know, I know there's a lot of people, they wear long robes and they hold their hands like this. And they, oh, they just look so holy. Don't ever be fooled by that, folks. Because, you know, I, I never was one to look very holy I guess because I never really tried to. But in my heart, I know that God's happy with what I'm trying to do. Now, I didn't say I'm perfect. And I didn't say I'm better than nobody. But God knows I try to do my best. And that's all he asks. You know, folks, it's not how big your Bible is. It's not the most expensive suit. It's what you got in your heart and how you feel about Jesus and how we feel about each other. Can you forgive each other? 
Do we love each other enough to where if I offend you, you can just blow it off and say, I love him anyway? Well, you do that for your kids. You do that for your mom and daddy. But why is it in church any little thing, any little thing? People get mad and quit, and half the time, it's over nothing. That's the devil. He's attacking us. But you know what? They enlarge the borders of their garments, and they try to look holy in front of men, and this is why. Verse 6 of Matthew 23, And they love the uttermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues. Folks, you know something? People like to be treated special, but you don't use God to get it done. When you work for God, you work for God in secret. You don't do stuff for God so everybody can see you. I've known so many people would do that. When you come to church, you know something? I've got to say this because in this church, there are stuff that gets done. Bathrooms get painted. Things get weed-eated. And nobody even knows who does it. It's all the time. I'll come up here in the bathroom been freshly painted and sheet rocked, and nobody knows who done it. Of course, I know because I find out. But they don't go around telling everybody. How many times I've been up here and the place been mowed and I'd ask the mower and he'd say, well, I've been out of town. Or weed eat it or, or just whatever. You know, folks, when you do something for God, you don't need to be patted on the back by man because you didn't do it for man. You done it for your Lord. Amen. Keep it between you and him. Well, you know, y'all, listen. Back in them days, there was people that actually would come to church to eat because, you see, it was a different time back then. And... The apostles would make sure everyone was fed before they went on their long journey home because they had to walk, most of them, or maybe ride a burrow, but they would feed them. Then you had people that didn't know Jesus, didn't want to know Jesus, but they was coming to church to get the free meal. Folks, I know people that go to church <clears throat> because they get a contract with the pastor's brother to build a home. I've known these things. <clears throat> and... I knew a fellow once that a church was going to add a big wing onto it. And, oh, boy, he, he changed his religion and everything and started going to that church and hollering amen and praise God. But as soon as somebody else got the contract, he never darkened the door of the church again, went back to his old religion. That's called using God. God is not mocked. And whatever you sow, that's what you're going to get. It's, it's amazing. But, you know, this is what we need to for, listen, in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three, 23, it talks about it. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthy shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a man examine himself, so let him eat that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Folks, you don't use God. And it don't matter what it's for. We don't use God. And you know what? There's so many people that will go to church because they want to be upstanding in their community. Or they want to have a certain job and it might help them because someone goes to that church that does the hiring. But you know something? This says, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty nine: For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself not discerning the Lord's body. And for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Now that sleep means God has killed them. You see, when a Christian dies, God calls it sleeping. But if you come to church and you don't do what it says, and you continue to live like a lost person, God can put a sickness on you to get your attention. And you know, folks, I've seen it with my own eyes. I've seen people get out of church and get off into the world, and next thing you know, they were calling me to bury them. Many sleep because they got away from God. You know, God saved your soul, and he bought you with a price, and nothing can take you away from God. And people say, I got a license to sin. No, you can get wound up in the graveyard if you don't watch that attitude. Because you're not going to live your life sinning and wallowing in the mud like a pig and expect God to continue to bless you. If you really are a Christian, you need to be in here where the Christians are praying and speaking and singing to God. This is your place. But you know, this is as we go on. 
For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Now listen, in verse 33, we're from our brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. You know something? I've been to some fellowships before where they had belly stretchings and people knocking each other out of the way to get up there to that buffet line. You know, folks, that's not how it's supposed to be. We're supposed to love each other. When somebody like old Wilson all crippled up and he's worked his life away, well, let him go first. He can barely stand there to begin with. Help him out. Carry his plate for him. But you know something? If you're not thinking like Jesus, you'd knock people out of the way and get your grub and you go and start hogging out. That's not the way to be. We should think of each other first. Amen. But you know what? If you're hungry, you need to stay home and eat. Now, if you're here with the Christians and you love God, you're welcome to eat. But this is telling us, don't come just for the food. Listen to what it says. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that you come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. You know, folks, it's something to think about. Everything you and I do in this church has got to be done for the glorification of God. And when you come here, you leave yourself at the door. The first thing Jesus said, deny yourself and come follow me. Deny yourself and take up your cross. That don't sound like an easy road, does it? But you see, that's why we get our little tender feelings, us little snowflakes. We get our little feelings hurt so bad. Well, if you deny yourself and focus on how Jesus suffered to save you, you might not be so tender. Amen? Well, here's a good story for you about not being for real. Now, I'm going to tell it to you first. Ananias and Sapphira were pretty well off. And at this time, the apostles was just getting together. And what the apostles would do, people were so fired up about being saved, they would bring everything they had to the disciples. And they lived like in a commune where they took care of the poor because it was a different day and time. And there was a lot of hungry people. You remember the man laid at the gate full of sores. A lot of that went on. But this couple, they sold a big piece of land. Well, when they went to meet the apostles at the church, they brought some of the money, but they didn't bring all of it like they were supposed to. Now, don't get this wrong. God didn't punish them for not bringing all the money. He punished them for not being for real. They came and they lied. They told him, Apostle, this is all we got for our property. You don't come to church and play games with God, folks. You don't lie to the preacher and don't lie to the Holy Ghost. I want to read a little bit of this to you. I'm going to skip around in Acts 5, 1. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. And Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thy heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? He lied. He told him that he'd give it all to him to keep back a part of the price of the land. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came on all them that heard these words. Folks, that man dropped dead right there in front of the altar for lying to God. Again, God's not going to kill you for not tithing your right amount, okay? But if you want to put on a show and make people believe you're the biggest tither in church, and you're not tithing at all, be careful. You're playing games with God. And again, right here, we see that his wife come in. She didn't even know her husband's dead. Apostle said, well, you sold that land. Yeah, we sold that land. My husband brought you the money. He said, well, they're burying your husband right now outside, and uh, they'll be coming here to get you. And she fell down dead. I just want you to understand this is not a place to play games. When you come to this church, you need to come here with a broken heart. You need to come here with a grateful spirit knowing that you deserve to be burning in hell. But God loved you so much, he went there in your place. You and I need to understand that we could so easily watch our children like they do in Ethiopia swell up and bloat out and die from hunger, but our kids are all spoiled rotten. Or we could be like in India when half the children are born blind because they have no vitamins for their optic nerves to develop. No, not here. We don't have that problem. I say it all the time. 
We're fixing to leave here. We're going to get in that car. We're going to turn on the air conditioner to the temperature desired. We're going to turn the radio on to our favorite song, and we're going to go to our favorite restaurant. We're going to feast like the pigs that we are. Amen? And you know what? Half the time, we don't think twice about what God has done for us. There was a time in the world where people like Attila the Hun would just travel from city to city and kill everybody that was there and rob them and rape the women and take the children. We don't have to worry about that no more. And we don't even think twice about it. We don't even appreciate it. You got places in China, they catch you with a Bible, they cut your head off. Church, you better not get caught going to church in China. But yet here in America, half the people don't go to church and the other half are wanting us to turn communist. <laughs> Cuckoo. But that's what happens when you get away from God. You know, y'all, listen as we read on. In Proverbs 105, 14. This is talking about your preacher. He suffereth no man to do them wrong, yea, he reproved kings for their sakes. You see, my job is not always an easy job because I can't just ignore when people are doing wrong. Now, I don't have no business to tell you what to do, but my business is to show you in the Bible what God wants you to do. You do what you want. But my job is to make sure you do know what is right and you do know what is wrong. I cannot allow you not to know that because I am the guy with the trumpet to sound the alarm to make you know whether you're messing up or not. In that comes sometimes retaliation. People don't like the preacher because he tells it like it is. People don't like the preacher because he won't make them feel good and pat them on the head. If you got one of them preachers, you got nothing. But listen... In Psalms 105, verse 15, saying, Touch not my anointed, and do my prophets no harm. You know, folks, there are people, and boy, I have seen this. There are people that go to church because they think they're there to tell the preacher what to do. There's usually two or three of them in every church. Raymond Poe used to say there was usually nine in every church, and he had been to a lot more churches, so Raymond might have knew more than me. But, uh, folks, you don't come here to tell me what to do, okay? You come here so this Bible can tell me and you what to do. And it's a sad thing when people like to boss people around, so they go join a church, and that way they can make the miserable, make the pastor miserable, and it happens. But this Bible said, don't touch the man of God. Don't talk about me behind my back. Don't run me down. I've always lived in fear of that kind of hard for me because I got a brother-in-law that's a pastor and families have trouble and sometimes I want to run him down but I can't because he's a preacher and I'm scared of that so I don't say anything you know what I mean I love my brother-in-law but I'm just saying you know you got to be careful with that don't touch the man of God don't touch him with your voice don't touch him with anything pray for your pastor you know God gives us a parable in Matthew 13, 24, another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that sowed good seed in his field. Oh, hey, he bought hybrid wheat. He plowed it and fertilized. He done it all. He had it irrigated. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. You know what? After they planted and they went on home, an enemy came in through handfuls of weeds. Weeds. Seeds of weeds. Well, when the blade was sprung up, it brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. You know what? When the little wheat started sprouting, it was pretty and green. All around it, the weeds start coming up with the wheat. They call them tares. So the servants of the householder came and said to him, Sir, didst thou not plant good seed in thy field from whence then as it tares? And he said unto them, An enemy has done this. The servants said unto him, Will thou that we go and gather them up? He said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up the wheat also. Let them both grow together until the harvest. In the time of harvest, I'll say to the reapers, Gather you together first the tares. Bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. 
Folks, this is talking about the church and the congregation. I know that most people, here we're a country church. I think our statistics are a whole lot different here because I believe pretty much all of us are for real. But you know, when you got a church of 3,000 people and you got two services of 3,000 people, I've seen some of those. Adrian Rogers, a great man of God, he passed away, but I mean, he was a great man of God. Uh, his church, I'd been there once, took three hours to get out of the parking lot. Man, there's no way he could know all them people. Couldn't be personal with them. But the Bible says there are some weeds growing amongst us. Well, what does weeds do? They choke out the fruit. So you see, Jesus is saying, be careful of that. Not necessarily the person sitting next to you is a Christian. Be careful. If what they sow is not uplifting and praising God and praising the brothers and sisters and promoting the house of God, well, then there's something wrong because they're choking the wheat. Be careful of that. And always know this. One day God's going to put you in his born. And boy, I'll tell you what, that's going to be a fine place to live, God's born. Amen? Amen. But the weeds will be bound up to be burned. Make sure today you're not a weed. Make sure today you are for real. Well, I know people come to church and they hurt people's feelings and they run people off, and I've seen that too. But this Bible says in Matthew 18, 6, But whosoever shall offend one of these little ones, which believe in me, it would be better for him if a millstone was hanged about his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. I never will forget one time I had some visitors come and sat right, right around in there somewhere. And a fellow at that time was very immature. And he come to the church and walked up there and cleared his throat three or four times and told them they were in his seat. Folks, if anybody ever comes to this church and they're visiting looking for Jesus and you're silly enough to go and do something like that, I'm going to choke you when I get you outside the church. <laughs> Just get you by the neck and choke you. Maybe it'll help you. But you know something? I'll sit on the floor before I would offend somebody visiting God's house. Well, as we go on, in John 13, 34, this is great. A new commandment I give unto you that you love one another as I've loved you, that you also love one another. Folks, we've got to love each other. And we can't be offended by every little thing and we can't get mad at each other because we got to love each other. And you know why we got to love each other? The last part. By this shall all men know you are my disciples if you love one another. Folks, church is not a country club. Church is not a place to come and let me pat you on the head and scratch your itching ears like an old dog. This is a place to come and get strong. This is a place to come and be loved. This is a place to come and share love and pray and help each other and learn about Jesus and open up that hymn book and lift your voices to God and sing to God. And no matter what, don't let the devil run you off from your church family. No matter what he does, don't ever leave your church family. Today, <clears throat> I want to stress the point. I hope you're not here as a church member. I hope you're not here as a Baptist. I hope you're here as a child of God. A born again Christian that that new person is hungry for this right here. You want to hear more of it and you can't wait till next Sunday. That shows you you're born again and you're real. You know something? If you are truly born again, when you come to this church, this message is going to talk to you. In so much as you might even think, hey, how'd that preacher know about my problems? Preacher don't know nothing about your problems. God knows your problems. And God can be talking to Jay about his job, and he can be talking to Larry about fishing too much. <laughs> don't get to fish enough, huh, Larry? We well, answered that quick. But you know, folks, you see what I'm saying? The Holy Spirit can speak to you and show you things that you need to know and make you understand, but only if you've been born again. You can read your Bible, 
And you can understand it if you've been born again. But folks, if you've never been saved, then you are that tear in the field. You are that lost church member that with your lips you praise, but nothing in the heart. Today, examine that heart and make sure you're a beautiful green stalk of wheat full of little heads of wheat for God. And you're bearing fruit and making God happy. I know nothing makes me, every morning, first thing I do with my cup of coffee is go look at my garden. And I look at my tomatoes, which ones are turning red, and my zucchinis, if they're ready to eat, and my cucumbers. I went out there yesterday morning. I had a big old green worm. He ate my tomatoes to the ground. Oh, he got mashed. I murdered him. But I want God to look at my garden, me, and say I'm very proud of my wheat. Oh, he struggles, and he ain't perfect, but he does the best he can. That's all God wants you to do the best you can. But be real. Be real. When some old woman says, oh, pray for me, my shoulder. Don't say I will and forget about it. You go home and you pray. Man, I seen something this week, and I'm going to close with this story. Me and my wife went crabbing and was going down Holly Beach, and all the people were running to the water frantically and screaming and I thought a shark was eating somebody, and Jerry said, look, in about a mile out there, there was a little boy and a little girl. The current got them and took them away, and that kid could barely, he just, he'd go under and he'd come back up, and you could tell he was swimming. Oh, he, he was just about gone. They had some little guy on a four-wheeler, some patrolman on the beach. Boy, I tell you what, he earned his money that day. He swam all the way, and the kid was not only going to Cuba, but he was also going that way too. And that little old police officer swam out there, and he got them kids. We stopped the truck, and we prayed right there, man. We had a prayer meeting until they got them to the bank. Of course, the devil punished me because my truck bogged down after that, and I had to pay $20 to get pulled out of the sand. But, hey, they got the kid to the bank, and the ambulance came, and he was all right, and praise God. We were so happy because that was a miracle we seen with our own eyes. But the little girl and little boy was saved. I don't know how I got off on that, but I just felt like I needed to tell you prayer works. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you today for your blessed word. Thank you for what you do for us and what we see you do. Today, Father, help us to examine our hearts to make sure when we come to church, we're so pure. We have one thing on our mind, that's loving you, Lord. Doing what it takes to make you smile and learning what we need to learn to be a good workman worthy of our meat. Today, Father, we thank you not only for hearing our prayers, but for saving our souls. That you went to that dreaded place called hell in our place that we can live and our children, our grandchildren can live and we can live together forever. We thank you for this little old country church, Father. It might not look like a whole lot to the rest of the world, but to us, it's a place of rest for our souls. Thank you, Father, for loving us. Thank you that your mercy never runs out. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.